It's Gear Expo Nashville Part 2. Producers, engineers, shock callers. Spitfire Willis introduces us to some really interesting people. You're at the place, and let the Church of Nashville say... Pensado's Place, y'all! <laughs> The afternoon kicked off with an incredible producer's panel. Nashville's finest, Justin Niebank, Rascal Flats, Ryan Hewitt, Lumineers, Emily Wright, everything with Dr. Luke. Vance Powell, one of the architects of the incredible Blackbird Studios, as well as the man behind, Ellie King, Jack White, Jakir King, Kings of Leon, Dave and Herb, of course, at the throttle. It was really incredible. Guys, everybody in this audience, you can tell by the engagement, the way they're looking at you guys, that they, they, they admire what you do. Uh, can you guys really quickly, one by one, just give them one pointer on how to get from A to B? Uh, there's a lot of talent out here, but they don't know quite how to get that talent turned into income. Uh, Justin, um, don't ask me the hard question. <laughs> you want me to come back to you, Justin? <laughs> Let me think about that. Like, what's the? What, it, there's no magic bullet, you know. Yeah. Um, but Become a lawyer. The, <laughs> <laughs> I meet so many young engineers, and I and I, ha I have to say that there's a point where I go, make another career choice. But uh, I, I get the passion for music, and I mean, if you're here now, I think that you, there's such a great networking going on here, and it's easy to network here. That's what's cool, and and uh, and to hang out as much as possible because if we have a live music scene now I think that's the key yeah. when I first got here there wasn't as much of a live music scene that's but now if you hang out you're going to meet everybody who's doing it engineers are there producers are there music, other musicians are there writers are there mm -hmm. and you'll if you just keep your nose in it I think it'll be alright Emily uh, along those lines how did you get uh, hooked up with Dr. Luke uh, Dr. Luke, you guys. I went to theater school. <laughs> oh, that, um, that explains it. Yeah, yeah. I get it, I get it. Uh, and I didn't know what I was going to do with my life because there's no money in theater. Mm -hmm. uh, and I ended up getting an internship in TV sound. And I thought it was what I was going to do for the rest of my life. Um, ended up getting laid off a couple months later. And the guy said to me, hey, I know you need a job. My friend... Um, needs help. I know you're not really in the music business, but like you could be a runner. And I was like, great, I really need a job. Um, and it was Dr. Luke. Wow. And I was his first employee. Wow. And I just ran errands for him for a long time and was there, just sat in the studio 24 hours a day, seven days a week, doing, watching. The first thing he ever asked me to do was can you edit the, the fades on the kick drum and the bridge? And I was like, yeah, totally. And he went upstairs. And I was like, I don't know what a kick drum is. I don't know what a bridge is. And I was like, label bridge, kick. I was like, okay, I got this, I got this, I got this. And I did it, and I learned by saying I knew what I was doing. Ooh, um, wow. But Emily, <laughs> she, she doesn't just, I mean, she's recorded vocals. She's known as a vocal producer. She's an amazing engineer. She's a, a um, I mean, uh, you, you look at your credits, and like one day you're working with uh, Flo Rider teaching him how to rap, apparently. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious. She's got a vocal production credit on Flo Rider. No I just did la his last thing in case anybody wants to know. And, um, <laughs> and then the next day you're, you're working with a country artist. Uh, that's just amazing. You, you're, you're just really special. Ryan, you not so much. <laughs> You know what, Ryan's story could be the most interesting uh, up here on the dais. Uh, no, it's pretty boring. No, it's not. No, it's not. Uh, give, him a, give him a little pearl of wisdom, because you, you know how much I love you, man. I love you too, Dave. I know. And her, a little bit. <laughs> um, I can't remember who said this to me the other day, but like, with regard to all things sort of creative, if you have a plan B, take it, because that means you're not dedicated to your plan A. Um, I've never had plan B. I can't imagine doing anything but this. Um, and I've, I've met some people recently who have left their successful career being a dentist or an eye surgeon or whatever and have decided they wanted to be in, you know, in music. And it's like, awesome. I hope you're getting used to you know, not having any money for a while. Absolutely. But uh, aside from that, I mean, for, for myself, I've just always tried to work circles around everyone I've been around. 
And um, I've had some interns fall asleep in my control room. I've had people say, well, I got a gig, I got to go. And I'm like, cool, don't come back. Absolutely. You know, if you're here, if you're in the studio, if you want to be learning and doing uh, what I'm doing, be here, be where you want to be. Like, I had a kid ask me, like, you know, how do I get success in the business? I live in the middle of nowhere. I'm like, move somewhere. <laughs> go somewhere where there's actually music happening and be where, be where the things you want to do are. You'll never have success growing up, you know, trying to make a, a record in the middle of nowhere. Maybe you will these days with the internet, but uh, your chances are highly improved if you move to a center where things are happening and, you know, having fun. I knew he'd, I knew he'd come through. Vance, you come through. you've got the enviable I'm position of helping build Blackbird. Um, you've worked there a long time. Now you're working in your own studio. I am. Uh, Express to us, is that a necessary thing? Is that something that, that helps? Um, what was your choice to do that? I mean, well, just, I just got to a point where I needed to have my own place. Um, you know, there's, there's two different types of studios in the world. There's commercial studios and there's uh, private studios. Um, commercial studios have to be comfortable for everybody. Oh, my gosh. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, commercial studios have to fit to every whim, and private studios can fit to my whim. So if I want to turn the lights out and turn blue lights off and turn blue lights on and, you know, take my pants off, I can do it. Uh, tweet God forbid. That. Need to tweet that. See, that's, a, that's a joke. That's a, that's, it's okay. not a joke. Okay, so um, these guys, I, I'm recording a band that did an entire take without pants last week. So... Uh, it's a long story, but um, but that can happen. Or, in, or a short in, story. In, in its, or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, my partner. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> good night. Um, thank you. Good night. Um, so uh, for me, uh, what happened was I was doing enough work that I really needed to have my own place because I couldn't get into the room so that I wanted to do to use because a lot of other people wanted to use the same place. So that's why I did it. And as far as the original question of how to get into this and make money, just keep doing it. Find somebody you like and work with them. And then just keep working with them and keep working with them. Most of the time it ends up badly. I'll be honest with you. Uh, most of the time, you know, you're going to spend a lot of time and you're going to waste a lot of time working with somebody who's not going to appreciate what you do. But in that, in that trip, that voyage, you're going to learn how positive. and Sister what positive. to do when that situation comes up again. So you find somebody you like and just continue to work with them until you have to kill them. You can turn two off now. <laughs> you can turn this off now. Yeah, Thank number you. Number two, turn Thank that you. off. Thank <laughs> you. Jakir, how, I mean, you've made one of my favorite records in Kings of Leon. How did you get that gig, buddy? And by the way, I went into your room, used your console, used your mic pre's, used your gear, and it didn't sound like you. What the F is going on? Well, first, I don't, first, I, first I the don't Kings sound, of Leon. I don't sound like anything. It's, it's the band and the, it's the artist in the room that sounds oh, like no, that. that's not true. Bullshit. Yeah, well. <laughs> how did you get the Kings of Leon gig? Um, well, that came around. Uh, I, I did some engineering with Ethan Johns, um, and we worked on a Nina, Go Nina Gordon record that didn't see the light of day. But um, but then I worked on, I engineered and mixed the second Kings of Leon record. And then when they when the Kings moved away from working with Ethan, um, I sort of was uh, offered the position of um, producing and engineering that. Mm -hmm. So that only by the night is how I got that that well, we gig. Just offered you, it, that's all. Well, I mean. Uh, we worked well together, and you know, um, th there's there's a certain amount of confidence. I mean, making records is difficult, and the re relationships you form, you know, sometimes they're very temporary. But um, they felt comfortable with me, and you know, and, and where they were in their career. I mean, you know, what I wanted to say about the advice part of it yeah. um, is that you know, early on, uh, early on in your career, when trying to not only get experience, like it's been talked about, uh, just do absolutely everything you can. I mean, there was a time in my life. Uh, when I lived in San Francisco, I was doing live sound, um, uh, working for bands, doing live sound. I would find bands to take to local small studios to make demos with, to try to, you know, just get some experience, try to get them a record deal. Um, I would intern at a studio. I'd volunteer at a studio. I wired patch bays, you know. I was working in somebody's basement, just wiring patch bays. I would work at a hip-hop studio. I did, you know, I did whatever 
I possibly could, and I spent all my money on gear so that I have that I would have tools <laughs> yeah, to understand better. how to, you know, because at a certain point, when you're trying to figure out what you're doing and nobody knows who you are, part of your appeal is the gear that you have. Now, now that's changed quite a bit with the technology you have, but then, you know, just do absolutely everything you can, work yourself as hard as you can, get as much experience, get as much exposure to genres and people, um, and then at a certain point, when you have the opportunity, start to be discerning. Start to only choose the things and spend your time on the things that you love. You know, sort of switch it. You like gather the information, make connections, discover. You know, I worked in I worked in advertising studios. I did all kinds of stuff. I would work like two sessions a day. You know, I'd work sometimes wouldn't sleep. Um, just kind of get to a place, and then then make a choice. And it's like I, you know, there's at a certain point, I have the luxury of sometimes saying yes and no to things. And, um, I mean, that's the hope for everybody, that we get to choose because we want to put our creativity into something. So, um, you know, go for it and do everything you can. And then at a certain point, start to say, that's what I want to do only and focus on that. So one of the things that, as you peer into the future, right, I think one of the things that has changed a little bit is the notion of the apprentice intern thing. Because now some people go to the Internet and they try to learn. And I think that can only take you so far. I think if you don't get hands-on and learn the psychology of stuff, for instance, in, in your case, Emily, vocals are a very intimate thing for an artist. You have to learn the psychology of dealing with different artists and different things. Is that, is that a fair statement? Yeah, I mean, I would be nowhere without, an, it, I mean, it was virtually an internship, an assistantship. For years, I sat next to <clears throat> Dr. Luke and I sat next to Max Martin while they did for years, just 16 hour days, and I just sat there silently doing nothing, watching. Um, when they needed something, I did it, and most of the time they didn't until they did, and then they'd be busy or they'd have to make a phone call, and they'd be like, you know, one day Britney Spears showed up early, and I called Max, and I was like, Max, what do I do? And he's like, start recording. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and I started recording, and he came. And she was like, hey, Max, can you leave the room? And he's like, okay. And he gave me a thumbs up. And from then on, I was the one who recorded her. So wow. it's just like, it was just from being there, you know? Wow. That's amazing. It's all story. luck. Wow. Um, but I would say just being there, being available, and being invisible. Also, like, not air drumming and not giving opinions. It's like <laughs> invisible and always there to me is the ultimate. And I would like to add to that. If the only thing that helped me is when I made the realization that it's not about the gear, it's not about being a big shot smarty pants, it's about the people you're around with. Mm -hmm. And if you connect with the people, everything is going to work out for you. I mean, obviously, these, what, everything these guys have said, by the way, is incredibly astute, and I hope you all really took it in, that you have to have passion and, and really willing to put in the time and be selfless. But the coolest thing about music is when you are actually able to collaborate with other people and it's everything becomes bigger than the sum of the parts. And if you're available for that and open for that, you'll succeed. I, I want to tell you guys, first of all, you can uh, go to whatever school you want to go to, which is great. The schools are great. Um, the most you're ever going to learn in this business is by doing it. Yes. All right? There, there is no substitution whatsoever for being put in the seat behind either behind someone like Dave any of these guys Ryan Emily Emmy any of them you're going to learn more in the first day of recording the first day of getting coffee and I'm not kidding you're going to learn more in the first day of getting coffee than you are <laughs> in so any true. of the school all right now I don't want to brag but I'm gonna oh, yeah. can Go I Preach, man. all right Preach. I've had four changed. assistants in my career. Wow. All right? The first one, the first one, Josh Smith, just finished the new Dead Weather record. He did Lazaretto with Jack White. The second one, Eddie Spear, standing right there. Eddie. Eddie. Eddie, what's up, man? Good to see you, Eddie. Congrats, Eddie, are you successful? Actually, that's not true. Eddie was number three. Number two was Mark Pataccia, uh, Jason Isbell, Southeastern. Rival Sons, all right? Uh, California Breed. I'm on my fourth now. He's right now recording at my studio. He's recording guitars and overdubs. The best thing that you can do is you find somebody 
that you want to work for, and you do whatever it takes to stand behind them. Whatever it takes for as long as it takes. Even if you don't get a job with them, you're going to learn, period. And that's the, that's the deal. I, personally, you know who I want to assist for? This guy. Me too. <laughs> and that's the truth. I really do. Wow. Wow. Because that's I exactly can't record it. like he does. Me neither. I can't do it. I can't mix like that guy at the end. I'm Justin. close. I'm close. close. I got my spring reverb. UAD just came out with a spring reverb BX20. I, got I you, have buddy. a real one. I got you. I'm on That's your actually back. That's really good. Everyone go get it. One. It's really good. I, I have a real a one. When we have, our, when we have our battle, I'll put my Leandro Hidalgo assistant against your best assistant. We'll both clean your clock and your effing assistant's clock. <laughs> Mixing, octagon, you name it, buddy. All right. There's a lot of shit talking hey, going I'll, on I'll, here. Hey, look, I'll kidding, I'm aside, down. I'll kidding aside, this is a brilliant man. And, and when he speaks, I listen. He's, he's had so many experiences. He can do so many things. And uh, I, would, I would actually say that about all these panelists. When any one of these guys, uh, we run into each other and they speak, I listen. Before we wrap up, um, we are on the show sort of preaching the idea that audio is everywhere and that if you become if you strive to be an artisan at your craft it gives you other opportunities in terms of jobs and other places because there's no discipline that audio is not in so you came from tv and went this way do you agree with that and do you think that that's an opportunity on the career side for folks what do you think Jakir. Jakir. Uh, i'm sorry it's Justin. okay I mean, I, I grew up in Chicago and I started off doing jingles and TV work and stuff. There's tons of other things. I mean, you know, Vance did live sound. I mean, that's, there's incredible stuff right now. I mean, that's where all the money is. If I, you know, so, and it's cool. And it's, you get to travel. So. And, and you get to be able to be Wear killed. black clothes. Wear Vance. black clothes and cargo pants <laughs> and, uh, and get the opportunity to be killed every single day. I thought your mic was off. Any, any, oh, yeah, turn this mic off, please. <laughs> anything, any, anything that you can do, live sound, film, advertise, anything you can do that involves the tools that we use is a great education. Emily, good, you agree? Yeah, I mean, I loved TV sound. If if the opportunities that came to me hadn't come up, I, that's what I would have been doing. Um, and I would I would second all that with just saying like, don't focus too greatly on exactly like this is my dream job. Right. Like, if a door opens, take it because that's what happened to me. It wasn't my dream job. It you know, but like, say yes. Because it, I feel like so many people are like, follow your dreams and then you get them. It's like, well, it doesn't really work that way. Like, follow the open doors and see where it takes you. I, no. That to me is so much more important. It's a zigzag, isn't it? Amen. It's a zigzag, correct? Oh. Ryan, you feel the same. You made the move. You uprooted your family. You came down here. We have the zigzag path. We have the broad kind of swath. It's our feeling, I guess from the show's perspective, that maybe there's no better time to be in audio that now audio with the technology, with the understanding, with the education, that now you can become so important to media and the process. Do you, do you think, do you agree with that? And what would you say to folks? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. I mean, for me, it's, it's being cognizant of where you are at that given moment of being present in whatever it is you're doing, whether it's cleaning the floor at home or getting the greatest snare sound you've ever heard in your life or a guitar sound or whatever, uh, being cognizant of what's happening, what you're doing, how lucky we are to be there doing that. Um, and as Emily said, recognizing an open door because an open door is not an obvious as a, as a literal open door. A metaphorical open door can be a, a little tiny, like, hey, come and make this demo for me. I got no money. And you're like, well, I have tomorrow available and I got some microphones. So you go and do it. Yeah. And then that's the next Kings of Leon or the next Avid Brothers or Flo Rider or whatever. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you got your game. Yeah. Yep. Stephanie Spitfire Willis was making the rounds to some of the incredible vendors and seeing what they had to say. So I'm over here at the Isotope booth hanging out with product manager Izzy, talking about all of this stuff going around. I see all of these, these guys carrying around Ozone 6, 
So obviously they're very excited to get that. But what everyone seems to be talking about is Ozone 7. What's special? Tell me what, give me Ozone 7, like summarize that for me. We're really excited about Ozone 7. We've packed a ton of features into it. So whether you're upgrading from five, four, five, or six, you're gonna get a huge value in Ozone 7. I think the most exciting thing is that we added an entire line of vintage products to the advanced version. If you upgrade to Ozone 7 Advanced, you get four brand new modules, a vintage limiter, a vintage compressor, a vintage EQ, which is sort of a Pultec style EQ, and a vintage tape machine to get you that tape saturation that's so popular right now. I'm hanging out with my friends Doug and Chris from Audio Technica. You guys are our sponsor of the show. Once again, I've seen a lot of people over at your booth. I want to know from you, what are people most excited about? Well, people are really excited about the headphones. You know, we have the uh, M50X. It's been out for a few years now, really popular. Got a couple new models. Seems like people are really picking up on those. Along with the uh, 50 series, our high-end studio mics. And what are, what are you guys most excited about? You know, I think one of the most exciting things that somebody said to us today was how much they appreciate us sponsoring this event in Pensado's place and having Vintage King, you know, give out the space for this kind of thing. It's really been exciting and it's great to see so many people and we saw a lot of students that were just asking all the right questions. So uh, that was really exciting. So I'm over here with Frank from Prism Sound and Massillac. I've seen a lo lot of people over here at your booth. What is going on? Tell me, tell me what's happening over here today. Well, we've got uh, meeting a lot of new people and a lot of old friends here in Nashville. Love it down here, great city. Uh, we've got a lot of interest in our converters. We do extremely fine converters, and this is our two-channel A to D, D to A. Well, it's two inputs, four outputs on the analog side, plus it's got digital I/O too, um, and it's a perfect thing for starting out and for mastering. It works the whole, whole, you know, the whole spectrum. Um, it's reasonably affordable if you're prepared to invest in, in what you're working in, in the, in the business. You know, if you want to, if you want to make money in this business, I think it makes sense to buy a really good piece of gear and it's, it's the best basically. Really, really good. Recording Connection and ProMaster were generous with programs, insights, and information. And we're very selective about the schools that we represent. You guys know about our relationship with Blackbird, how seriously we take it. We think they're the Yale of audio. There's some incredible programs, Belmont being one, MTSU being one. What these guys do that we think is smart is we call it the community college approach. It's learning where you live so you don't have to necessarily uproot yourself and go someplace. Um, they make it economical and they make it smart and they utilize a lot of people who ordinarily wouldn't get a chance. So do me a favor, give a round of applause to Brian Kraft. Brian! On the Nationals Finest panel, you're going to meet some people that they have started a program with called Learning from Legends. Brian, you want to explain that? Yeah. Hi, everybody. How are you? Um, Brian's smooth. He's good looking. He's like Johnny Depp after taxes. It's really kind of cool. So, <laughs> uh, Learn from Legends is a new program we just launched about a month ago. And it builds upon our, our, our first program, which trains you one-on-one -on -one inside a real recording studio anywhere in the nation. So you learn as an apprentice, one-on-one. -on -one. You learn hands-on from people who are actually doing it for a living. Um, you, you have a structured course curriculum, and you do your thing two to three to four times per week in the studio. No classroom-based education. It's just recording uh, studio education. The Learn From Legends program is a new program that we just launched, which takes and builds upon that beginning apprenticeship model you get into the same situ situation, but from legendary audio engineers and music producers. Like so, who? Like who? Name Al some. Schmidt, Nico Bolas, Ryan Hewitt, F. Reed Shippen, Vance no, Powell. Ryan Hewitt. Ryan Hewitt. So Learn From Legends is a way to take uh, your education to the next level and become, and to get to sit, not only sit next to, but apprentice under legendary audio engineers and, and music producers. Dave and I met a company about eight months ago called Aftermaster, yep. and we met the people, we looked at the process, and we looked, and then we went and talked to some of our mastering engineer buddies, Gavin Lurson and a bunch of other really credible guys, and we said, what do you think? And they said, it's part of the business, it's coming, we should select them. So please welcome Ari Blitz from ProMaster. Ari, how are you? Doing well, thanks. 
Travis, we need two up, please. You there? Hello. There we go. There we go. So, so Ari, right, give us a sense of the process. Pro master on it, didn't it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, it needed pro mastery. Give us a sense of the process, how it applies in the marketplace, and what do you think? Sure. Um, well, basically, everybody knows, you know, you, you need to master your song. Um, but there's a, there's a real need out there for people that want quick mastering. They don't want to hire an engineer. They don't want to pay a lot of money. So what we did was we took our mastering chain and we made, we made an algorithm out of it. And um, basically, we put it on, on our site, promasterhd.com. And it's free to try out. You can upload your song. You get back a minute and a half to hear. We give you four different versions. Um, you listen to it. If you like it, you buy the song. It's $34.99. So you're not hiring an engineer. You don't have to call, make an appointment. It's uh, very, very convenient. It works all hours of the day, of course, because it's a website. So, um, you know, we encourage people to, to try their mix, send it up. If you get something back and maybe you need a little more kick drum, change your mix, send it back up again. Well, this is a real necessary tool to, to help you guys. Our shot caller panel included legendary Tony Brown former chairman of MCA and noted superstar producer. Lane Wilson, 21-year partner at William Morris Endeavor. John Mason, attorney for Reba McIntyre and many other people. And Nashville staple, the one and only John McBride. So Tony, from your perspective, whether you're a label chief or you're producing a record or whatever the case may be, if you're not able to do that record and then put it into the hands of people who care, and then make sure that they execute the vision that you had creatively so that it has some commercial success, You've, your work just kind of sits there. It's like you need those other folks. Is that correct? That's right. You know, I've done so many things. Even being the president of a label, I've done records that never came out. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and they were my favorite things I've ever done. But then, when you do put a record out, you've got to have the collaboration. The label's got to be behind it. The people that work at the label, the soldiers that take it to radio, have That's to right. like it. You have to have a team That's right. that takes it to the public. That's right, 100%. So, and the, and the reason why this panel is important to you guys, because when you get to this level, if you're not cool, if you're not in touch with these kind of guys, you're gonna fail. So for all the people sitting here, you're, you're getting a competitive advantage right now. One of the things that also happens <laughs> is that, that as you go <laughs> up the ladder, then what happens is you have all kinds of things to protect intellectual property, contractual relationships, going after money, disputes, other kinds of things. So John, in that process, John Mason, it, you end up having to go to lawyers, correct? If you're not protecting yourself, you're hurting yourself. Would you agree? Yeah. It, um, my primary job, notwithstanding representing slavery, is to get the money because <laughs> hopefully... 1.2K a, uh, there, brother. <laughs> it's, it's business, right? You have the music business, you have the film Speak business, the you, have the te you have the television business, film business, music business, <laughs> business management. Show me the money. That's my job is get the money, make sure everybody gets paid because none of this stuff is free unless you get a winning ticket here at Pensado's place. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're hearing is, is that once it gets up into this kind of puzzle where you've gotten to the top of the heap, you're balancing all kinds of different things, a collaboration, of, you're running a bunch of different teams, your lawyer has to be making sure they're lawyering, your business manager has to be business managing, your label has to be labeling, your agency has to be agenting and all that kind of stuff. And then you take somebody like John McBride who has a multi-level, I mean, look, we're not very, we're not really, we're, un, we're like crazy about John McBride, so you may have to take what I say, the grain of salt, because I'm, <clears throat> but here's a guy who is a studio chief, risks all the time. His school is one of the finest schools in two years ever, and happy to say is, is profitable as of October, I think. Uh, which is First amazing. Time ever. First time ever. This is a guy who goes out on the road every weekend and does live sound. In between that, he goes to his studio and mixes records. Um, he mentors people. He is one of our principal sponsors, and anytime we've looked into the abyss, John McBride has stepped up and made sure we're okay. Um, you don't do that unless you're passionate. When I first met him, I was scared as hell of him. I'd heard so many shit. I was just sitting there like frozen. And he took us on a tour, and I watched a guy who's given this tour probably 5,000 times give it 
the tour 5001, same passion, same thing about Mike, same stuff. So now when you run all those multi-level things, you have a lot of things you have to oversee. Lawyers and agents and all that kind of stuff. It can drive you crazy, but it's a necessary part of the business, would you say? Well, no, no doubt about it. I, you know, one thing at the Academy, the first thing I always tell everybody who shows up there is that attitude is 99% of the gig. And I don't care if it's in the studio or on the road or with your parents or your brothers and sisters or your friends. Having a great attitude is going to get you further in life than any fucking school, any program, any whatever. Have a great attitude and have people want to be around you and you are going to succeed. You're going to have a hell of a lot easier time. The second thing I recommend is marry a rock star. But anyway. <laughs> Good advice. Well, no, a farm girl from Kansas who has her head on straight. Thank you, God. So, you know, I, I'm very fortunate. I grew up in Wichita, Kansas. Well, there's, the music business is not in Wichita, Kansas. However, we had a great club scene. I wanted to be involved. I borrowed six grand. I went to the... A campus credit union of Wichita State, and I bought a 12-channel mixer and two speakers and two mics and a power amp and a stereo 10-band EQ, and I put up signs in the bars that said PA for rent. And somebody <laughs> called, and I was working in music, and that's what I wanted to do, and I knew it was where I needed to be, but I had never even considered that I could have a career in music. When you're in Nashville, Tennessee, you've got labels, you've got all the infrastructure of the music business. You have booking agencies, management companies, publishing companies, recording studios, four or 500 in this town. It's insane. And I love it. And an incredible amount of great players here. So you're in the right place. That helps a lot. That'll save you time. You come to Nashville, LA, New York, in that order, I would say, Chicago, Austin. They're all good music centers, but there's more going on in this town than any other place on the planet that I know of, and I'm just proud to be part of it. I will tell you that from Dave and I's perspective, and I, there was a period we went through we started the show, I was depressed about the music business, and the audio thing seemed more interesting to me. Now I see that there, I'm seeing rays of light. I'm seeing between the technology, we're figuring out the digital media side. You know what's funny is, I am so schooled by John McBride, I'd rather run north on the southbound freeway than not talk directly into this mic because he will club me. Right? So I, am, I am conditioned well, by You guys him. have heard everything Herb said, right? Oh, no question about it. Oh, no, I'm right here, baby, right here. <laughs> um, but don't you think, Tony, that there's, there's... I think there's hope moving forward. I think it's evolving into a business that we can start to see stuff in. Is you, do you feel that way? Yes. Oh, that's good. That's a good answer. You know, it's like watching this guy that played over here a while ago. It, it just blew my mind. It made me feel like a Kroger sack boy. <laughs> I mean, because, you know, I was have been in this business where everything pretty much was played by musicians on the floor. And still, still happens that way, thank God. Yeah. But if I was a musician after seeing that dude play, it'd be kind of scary. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, the thing about it, you've got to have some sort of thing that draws people in. I was standing back here, and I, I found myself walking closer and closer yep. to watch what he was doing. Yep. And even though it was electronic, he was present, so present. And he blew my mind just watching him. And uh, he doesn't need a band. Right. He just needs himself. Right. I think anytime you do something, you know, used to be it was ears first and eyes second. You'd hear something and you'd go, what do they look like? How old are they? I want to go see them play live. Now you see something at a club, you see eyes first, and maybe you don't hear coming off the stage what you could think could be a, an act that could cut records. So you see eyes first and you go, I don't, I don't like what I'm seeing. And I think if I could get that in a studio, I could make that into something that the whole world would love. So... Anymore, anything you do when you play, you give it your best. You know, I, through the years, I've got to work, uh, working in country music. I've got a couple chances to work. I did a track with Billy Joel for a, a tribute record for Leonard Cohen. And so I wondered, why would he call me? And they said, he heard Guitar Tim by Steve Earle, and he wanted the guy that did that. To, to do this track. 
And I was going, Gap, God, I'm glad I spent a lot of quality time making that record because that record's not really a rock record. It was just a, a, an impact-making record. But that record got me the job to cut a track with Billy Joel. And that didn't make me any money, but it made me feel like I was hot shit. <laughs> and then, you know, uh, later on in life, I got a call one time from someone said that Barbara Streisand wanted me to come and cut a track on her. And I was going, why in the hell would Barbara Streisand want me? And they said, well, James Brolin, her husband, played a George Strait song on their first date. And she wants you to come cut that song on her new album exactly the way you cut it on George. So I took a Paul Franklin on steel. I took Stuart Duncan on fiddle out to L.A. We went to Capitol Records, and we cut the track. And I was thinking, wow, man, you never know when you're doing something what it's going to lead to. So whenever you do something, do it at the best of your ability. Give it 100% because... You don't know who that one person standing out here in this crowd today could be somebody that's going to tell me, hey, I want you to cut something on so-and-so. And I'm going, God, I almost didn't come today because I don't like doing these panels because they scare the shit out of me. <laughs> Excuse me, kid. He said that. <laughs> and, you know, I was telling uh, Justin Ebank earlier, I said, you know, it's so wild. Trying to make it is so much more fun than trying to sustain it once you've made it. Because once you, when you're trying to make it, when you, get a, you make a step forward, you make a little bit more money, or somebody that's really cool likes it, you go, damn, I'm, it's working. Yeah. But then once you've made it, and you get your lifestyle, you're living, you're driving the nice cars, you live in Bellmead, and plus you've got a track record, trying to sustain your body of work and deserve what you've done is, is, is a chore. As I heard a guy say, he said, you know, the only thing better than getting praise is deserving praise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I, I'm just really blessed to have been in this town and, and been in this town during the time from 89 to 97 when it exploded. I was talking to someone the other day about Blackbird, and they said, uh, what do you think about Blackbird? And I said, it's the best studio in Nashville. And then some guy said, no, it's not. It's the best studio in the United States. In the world. In the world, yeah. I mean, and Lionel Richie, when he came here, he only wanted to go to Blackbird. And every, every studio I cut and record at, we rent stuff from Blackbird. <laughs> if they don't have it, they, they say, Thank you, call Tony. Blackbird. Because <laughs> John's got five of everything. John bought that, everything up. That's There's right. no more left. That's right. <laughs> And, and, and I, I, I saw him at a radio shack trying to find something the other day to buy. You know, here, here's the fact of the matter. The previous panel with Justin Niebank and Vance and Dave Cobb and Jakir and all these incredible people, Ryan and... I don't know the girl. I just met her today. But Emily, yes. And uh, I, I, I didn't on purpose. And then Tony Brown and... I, I, I don't know you guys, but I know of you and I know what you do. The level of quality here is... Absolutely, the bars up here, and that's what you need to strive for at all times. You you want to do the best anyone can ever do, and that was a lot of my motivation behind building that studio. Was Na L.A. and New York treat Nashville like a redheaded stepchild, and I thought bullshit. We have the greatest players, great engineers, great producers, great songwriters. We should have one of the greatest studios anywhere. And that was a lot of my motivation, and that's why that place exists, that and the Beatles. So <laughs> yes, that's right. you just keep the bar high and don't give up, and eventually someone will figure it out and you will do all right. And that's don't give up. I was in Wichita, Kansas, living in a warehouse because I had a live company. I mean, if you want to call it that, it was a couple of monitor rigs, uh, club rigs. And I couldn't afford an apartment, and I couldn't. Aff I traded a pair of speakers for a car, so you can imagine what that was like. You just don't give up. Now I have a pretty unbelievable life, and I'm very blessed that I get to work in music and make a living. And it's it couldn't be better. If I didn't do this, I'd be homeless. So I'm very fortunate. <laughs> Let me tell you one of the di yeah round of applause, please. The fact that you're here, listening to this panel. 
while some others may have had to leave for time, but it was important enough for you to be here, already differentiate you from some of your peers. So I, I, Dave and I applaud you because that's literally how we built the show. We just stayed. When people didn't know, and we said, we'll, we'll continue to learn, and we rode around and stuff, and Will Thompson taught us, and so on and so forth. So it applies. It's never not part of the business. And John Mason, as he looks, and he's just started his own firm and hung his own shingle, you have to find the kind of clients who have this kind of passion. You don't want to represent people who don't care, do you? Hey, I wanted to tie two things together sure. because we might be getting to the end of this. Some people might want to get us out of here. Yeah, they do, but, but <laughs> no, I'm, we, I'm holding them. Yeah, we, we work together collaboratively. I like that, and I just want to say that for, for me, started with Creedence Clearwater Revival and Donna Summer and Beach Boys and Jacksons and tons of acts. I will not be doing this job tomorrow if I don't get new artists because all of those people started just like all of us with no, 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 we didn't know anybody like John, you know, you, my dad was a butcher, so I didn't, I didn't know how to do this, but you meet people. I like that, Herb. You meet people. I want to know who's playing live and I'll go if somebody tells me it's great. And if I've got an act that I think is really, really, really good that I believe in, I got to call Lane. I got to call Greg Oswald. I got to call Tony Brown and I got to try to move that train forward any way I can because I promise you, I won't be here if I don't have five new big successful artists within the next five years. I'll be on some panel about guys living in retirement homes. So yeah, that's what we do. And keep at it because there's always gonna be somebody that believes in you. But you have to believe in yourself first. The same passion that you hear up here, and as John said, you heard from the panel before, it should be dawning on you that if you ain't got that gear, you can't get to this gear. That other gear is required. You, you, fair to say, Lane? Absolutely. In fact, we were talking before we came up on the panel, and uh, John and Tony were saying, how's it going over there? You know, 22 years I've been there. Wow. This is the best year so far. No joke. It's the Wild West right now. Anything can happen. We've got all these new tools to work with. You see artists working their socials and, and blowing up overnight. Um, we have a YouTube department now out yeah. in the L.A. office. Yeah. It's the Wild West, and it's exciting, yeah. and that's what makes it the best year so far. And, you know, I'm qualified probably to be digging ditches somewhere, <laughs> but I get to do this for a living. It's just amazing. So, that's anyway, amazing. it's exciting to come to work every day. John McBride, how do you see the future, buddy? You feel good about it? I think people are listening to more music than they ever have. Um, some way, somehow, we'll figure out how to monetize it where at least the producers and songwriters and artists get paid fairly. Um, it's, you know, the music business has been waiting around for 15 years for someone to come up with a great model, and I don't know that it's happened yet. Uh, it seems like streaming may be, may be a big part of it. I don't know. I, I feel great about the future. I know that there's a lot of like-minded people that love music like I do and that have to be in music. They don't have a choice. And I believe that if you really care and you're persistent and you work hard and you have a great attitude, you're going to succeed one way or the other. It's going to happen. I really believe that. And if you feel like you've got all that and it hadn't happened, call me sometime, you know? Let's talk. Because I'm always looking for great people. So... That's about all I can say right now. John Mason, you're down here in Nashville. You made the move from L.A. You were a staple in Los Angeles. Um, it feels to me that the energy and the environment down here is unlike any other place ever. It's really hard for me to go home. I'm telling you, we just feel... So given the fact that you need to be collaborative and given the fact that we're all excited about the future and given the fact that this city... Fuck it, this... Uh, where's Toby? Screw it. Damn it. Something. This city is the baddest musical city in the country, period, as far as I'm concerned. Period, dot. It's just, there's nothing like it. Does that portend well for the future? Part of the reason you made the move and excite you about moving forward? Is, is Nashville part of it and what you see in the youth and the tools? Well, I've been coming here for uh, 43 years. Started here in 73. Wow. Back with uh, you Eddie Rabbit. for your age, bro. E even Stevens and... I never wanted to live in Nashville, but when I came here two years ago, when my youngest of my seven kids started at Belmont, I was blown away by the changes and by the openness that we're seeing right here with, with John, with Blackbird. I like your story about building Blackbird because the best studio should be where the best musicians are and the singers and the songwriters. And yeah, I'm from LA and I did really, really well there. This is 
as, as uh, Herb would say, this is fucking more exciting than anything I've ever done. And I really am proud of you all for being here and trying to learn and get in it because you'll never succeed in this business if you don't start in the bottom and work your way up and you're doing it. Lane, anything you want to say in wrapping up? Yeah, I will say one thing. John and Brad touched on it. You know, um, everything's great right now. It's a Wild West and best time ever. The one thing we got to work on together is try to how to ex uh, extract higher performance rights for the, for the artists yes. and the musicians. And I think we're finally at a spot where we're all talking about that together. We got to work on it with the politicians in DC. It's, I know it's hard yep. to get anything done in DC, yep. but I think we're all ganging up together and we're going to get something done in the next few years because without a good song and without the artist, n none of the rest of us exist. That's right. So that's the one thing we're missing and we need to all team up together and keep pushing that forward. Wrap it up for us, bro. What do you think? Well, you know, it's funny. One time Don Was was in doing a record and he went and spoke to our class and he said, take every gig, no matter how bad they are, no matter how crappy they pay, whatever. He goes, I was doing this really horrible gig and because I met Bonnie Raitt because of that gig and he ended up doing Nick of Time for her the next record and made and it was very, very successful. So must be present to win. <laughs> also, I want to say good is the enemy of great because we're tempted to accept good, but honestly, unless it makes you go, wow, keep working because great gets everybody's attention and there's a ton of good songs out there that I wouldn't spend a penny on. But when it's great, I'll beg, borrow, steal to, to get it and I want, you know, I have to have it. So, you know, I try to live by the golden rule. Treat people like you want to be treated, have a great attitude, work hard, and aspire for greatness. And you know, those are good qualities to have. Big thanks to my co-producers, Chevy Shovlin and all the Vintage King family, Stephanie Spitfire Willis, the work was incredible, and all the rest of the Pensado team. We'll close out now with more from the ridiculous Jeremy Ellis. See you next week. Play me.